year, and I am excited and proud to partner with Joe Spence, who is the executive director and head of Space Apps New York. Thank you. Yeah, as I know, as you said, I'm the executive director of SpaceX NYC. Uh, we love to partner with Amelisa and Women's Fear and hosting many events throughout the year uh, and to promote STEAM, all uh, STEM events uh, to our New York community. Uh, we host many events before and we love to kick off the uh, Women's Sphere Festival and the uh, Space App season uh, with this cocktail event. So thank you all for coming. And in the spirit of thinking about innovation, exploration, discovery, and NASA, we are so honored, excited, and really, you know, beyond thrilled to have with us the head of the NASA Goddard Institute, Dr. Gavin Schmidt, to share with us an inspiring message. Uh, our uh, work uh, really encompasses climate observations, the impacts of climate change, simulations of climate change that allow us to say uh, why things have changed in the past, why things are changing right now, and what that means for the future. And uh, we throw in, because we're NASA, we throw in a little bit of exoplanet climatology. Uh, we're trying to work out what the climate is around exoplanets that we found uh, orbiting nearby red giants like Proxima Centauri. That's kind of cool. What we mostly do is we make simulations of, of this kind of thing. Um, some of you might recognize the, uh, the hurricanes that are, that are just about to impact uh, the US. Uh, this is a, a simulation of uh, the weather and the climate of last summer. Um, what you're seeing, the white, is smoke from fires uh, that were burning uh, in, uh, in British Columbia. They've gone away now, they'll come back in a minute. Um, and that's Maria there, you can see uh, that uh, after having hit uh, Puerto Rico. The, uh, the dust coming off the Sahara, that, that's uh, that actual dust, the blue is the sea salt that's been whipped up by the winds uh, associated with you know, these. Uh, these hurricanes and storms and here you can see some of the, the smoke coming from these fires that, that reaches you know all the way across the continent. There are some atmospheric rivers that are kind of drenching some of this area in water. What you can see when you look at this data, at these simulations, is how connected the whole planet is, the whole system. What you're seeing is Go to the advertising section. <laughs> Everything is connected. You're seeing the, the contents of the atmosphere being pushed around by the winds, by the currents, by the, the, the storms. And each of those elements that you can see, the dust, the smoke, the sea salt, each of those is affecting the climate itself, and that's actually changing how the winds and the currents are pushing those things around. And so you have this very elaborate, complicated dance, which is beautiful and, and data-rich, but also really, really complicated. Our task as scientists is to understand what's going on. And there's so many interesting stories that are happening in these data sets, in this real world. There are so many interesting things to see. Stories about Irma and Jose and Harvey and Maria and the impacts that they have, not just on the rainfall, but on the systems, our human systems. The impact that we've had, that Maria had on Puerto Rico is far more complicated than just, oh, it was rainy and there was wind, but no. It devastated that, 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 that area. It had impacts on people's lives. 3,000 people died because of that storm, but not because it was windy and it was rainy, because the systems collapsed in the, in the, advent, in the, uh, in the wake of that storm. And in the wake of these storms, you can see things happening, not just in the ocean, not just in the atmosphere, but also in the human system. We, 
we work at NASA, and I have to say, like working at NASA never gets old. Right? I say, oh, I work at NASA, and everyone goes, oh, that's, oh, that's cool. It's so cool, in fact, that um, you know, one, of, one of the female scientists that we have, uh, she, was, uh, she was in a bar downtown, and uh, some guy comes up to her and he says, uh, I work at NASA. And she says, oh, great, so do I. Which, which, uh, which center do you work at? Marshall, Goddard, because I know a whole bunch of people there. And he goes, and then walks away. <laughs> so beware people who say they work for NASA. I do actually work for NASA, but, uh, um, but be careful. The great thing about NASA is that, generally speaking, it's very open. I started working for NASA because I had a, a, a friend who was working in New York, and I needed a place to work in New York, and I went to all these different places, and I went to the NAB at NASA, and I said, hey, can I work here? And they said, sure, you can work here. And it worked out, and I've been there for 20 years, and I now run the, the lab uh, that, like I said, is up near Columbia. And NASA is always about three things. What can we see? What is actually going on? What can we observe? And we're looking at the details of everything that we can see on Earth, on Mars, around other star systems, in the deep universe, and what can we see? The second part is how do we understand what we see? How do we put it together? How do we connect it to our understanding of physics, our understanding of climatology, our understanding of astrophysics? And third, and this is absolutely key, what does it mean? What does it mean for the future? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the, perhaps the ultimate fate of the universe? Right? That seems like a big deal. But we care about those things. But you have to have all three elements. You have to have the observations that lead us to understanding. You have to have the people synthesizing the observations and putting it together with theory and simulation so that we can understand what it is that we're seeing and how things are changing. And then we have to know what it means. Without that third element, we're just wasting our time. We're just creating eye candy. It's like, it's like science, yay. But I, Science is not a yay thing. Science is for us to make things better. And it has done on many, 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 many different fronts. And it can continue to do so. Sometimes it does it by giving us a warning. We end up, unfortunately, people who are working on Earth science, we often find ourselves in the unenviable position of predicting things skillfully, things that are going to happen, but not wanting those things to happen. We can predict with great certainty when a hurricane is going to make landfall in North Carolina. But we don't want it to make landfall in North Carolina. We don't want it to impact the systems in Puerto Rico or in Miami. We don't want sea level to affect water supplies all up and down the, west, the east coast. We don't want these things. We can predict that, and we did ahead of time, that 2016 was going to be the warmest year on record. And we predicted this basically a year ahead of time. And then as all the data comes in and we feel, oh, Look, our prediction is coming right. Like with, oh, aren't we clever? Aren't we so clever that we can take these observations and use our understanding and predict something that is actually going to happen? We've wrestled information from the universe, that complex universe that you saw, and we've made a prediction that actually happened. And, and, our, and our scientist brain says, yeah, aren't we clever? But we're not just scientists. We're also human beings, and we're also citizens, and we're also parents and children. And that part of our brain says, I, I don't want that to be true. I don't want it to be the warmest year on record. I don't want the sea level to continue to rise. I don't want 
hurricanes to become more intense. I don't want more rainfall to come. And that gives us this, this, this weird dissonance. Now, we're not the first generation to have felt this. Uh, people in, 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 uh, in, in the recent past, uh, uh, people involved in, in the ozone depletion crisis and problem and solution. Uh, and one of them, uh, Sherwood Rowland, who, who subsequently won the Nobel Prize for chemistry for, the, for his understanding of how uh, the increase of, of CFCs, Freon, uh, in the stratosphere were going to lead to ozone depletion. He said, what is the use of building a science that's good enough to make predictions if, in the end, all we do is sit around and wait for them to come true? And that's exactly right. We're making predictions not because we want to sit around and wait for them to become true and feel good about ourselves that we're so clever. We make predictions so that if this is an outcome that we do not want, that we can work together intelligently to try and prevent the worst impacts of those predictions. The challenge that people have here with the, with the space apps, the, uh, the work that uh, NASA is doing in, in having all of its data be public domain and having these challenges and having people be able to look at this and see and understand and predict is absolutely vital because it isn't just an academic exercise. It is truly a, a, a challenge not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but for, but for all time and for all of us. And NASA is at the absolute forefront of bringing that information to the level of people, not just to be apping and hacking and, and looking at this data, but to really be using this understanding to make better choices and to make better choices at all different levels of society. So I commend you and your, your efforts to, uh, to build these... Uh, uh, the, these apps and, and, and to work on these, uh, on these problems, these are real problems. And, and it's only by entraining the maximum amount of brain power from all the different segments of society that we're going to be able to get anywhere in dealing with the consequences of our understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gavin. We're so honored to have you with us. Welcome to the family. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, actually, thank you for having us be a part of the family. Um, so this is, it's, it's so great. Do you want to do a Q&A? Is there? Oh, I mean, if anybody yeah, do you have? Does anyone have, I mean, people probably have burning questions. No, no. Or you can just. We can always like. Chat have, over cocktails. Yes, chat over cocktails. Yes. Just a quick question. Since you do work at NASA, um, how do you see the escalating uh, role of like private space exploration companies, say like SpaceX, in the domain of space and in comparison to NASA? Great, we'll get this second question. Well, I, it's quite different, but you mentioned NASA's research uh, is based off of three principles of um, um, being able to see, uh, that would think was the first one, and then understand. How does that relate to quantum particles and quantum physics and uh, things that we are not able to see? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I use C in a kind of colloquial way. I mean, it doesn't have to be something you see visually. I mean, the, we use a lot of visualizations at, at, from the macro to the, to the super macro um, to understand what's going on. I mean, seeing, I mean, we use tools to help us see far beyond what we can actually see with our eyes. Uh, and that means going down to the very small and, and up to the, to the very large. Where, um, you know, I was, I was talking to some people working at, um, on the ANITA project, uh, and we're talking about, you know, quantum particles. Uh, they're running balloons uh, from the South Pole and trying to see what's, what the impacts of cosmic rays um, coming through the Earth and then kind of coming out at the South Pole are and trying to see if there are new particles that they can see. And they think they've found like a new supersymmetric particle um, that like, but they found it like four times. So 
it's like, is, is, that, is, that, is that real? Who knows? And so, you know, so, so our NASA is, is like, we're, we're involved in, in all of those questions. Um, so hopefully we will see something associated with that. Your question about um, private uh, space. You know, NASA is, is really ready to partner with anybody. And there are some things that you can do more efficiently if you're focused and you're, you're starting off from scratch. But NASA isn't going to compromise on things like human safety, right? So even, even SpaceX and, uh, and Blue Dragon, you know, if they're, and they're trying to do, uh, they're trying to be certified for human spaceflight, you know, NASA is not going to cut corners uh, in order to help them uh, do that. I mean, so when you're putting, when you're putting a person in space, it, I mean, so when you put a robot in space, right, you know, Curiosity, Opportunity, Voyager, you know, the most important thing is the science and the data they bring back. When you put a human in space, the most important thing is to bring them back. So that shifts a lot of the dynamic, and it makes it very, it, it, it's difficult. It's not, not worth doing, right, because there's some things that only humans can do in space, like the Hubble resupply missions um, and, you know, the work that's being done on the ISS. Uh, but it is a, uh, uh, that making that partnership work is, uh, is a little tricky sometimes. But it's, uh, but it's certainly worth pursuing because really it's all hands on deck, right? Everybody, everybody can contribute and, and as long as it's being done coherently and safely, uh, then they're welcome aboard. Thank you so much, Gavin. You're Thank welcome. you so much. And Gavin's going to be with us through the evening, right? Yeah, so they're, they're cocktails, right? Yes, they're yeah, cocktails, exactly. Yeah, they're Cocktails. Yes, he's here for us and the cocktails. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. And you know, one of uh, Women's Fear is super excited to support and partner with and sponsor Space Apps New York. I'm personally, you know, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. Who doesn't, right? Who hasn't? Um, and the closest I could get was a NASA data knot. So NASA data knot, which I am, is an explorer of data. Um, whereas astronauts explore space, NASA data not explore data. And I am also now very much um, proud to support Space Apps New York and this amazing leader that we have, Joe Spence. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, the work that NASA does, uh, not just sending people to the moon, but the problem solving. Uh, is really what gets me inspired every time we come to a space apps event, every time I do anything when it comes to space exploration or NASA. Uh, it's really what got me interested. I mean, I wasn't, everyone I talked to in the space industry, they were around, you know, watching the moon landing in the 60s. Obviously, my generation doesn't get that. We get to the Curiosity landing, that's really cool. But what really got me interested in space from when I was a kid was seeing scientists at NASA tackle problems that no one imagined of tackling, solving problems one after another, to the point where you do put someone on the moon, or you do shoot off a rocket and land a, a rover on a comet a billion miles away. Um, and it's that kind of initiative that really brings me and the 25,000 people who come to the Space Apps Challenge every year coming back every year to contribute to that, because I'm not a scientist, I'm a software engineer, a lot of people are software engineers who come to the hackathon, but most people aren't. And if you're interested in space, if you're interested in NASA, if you believe in what they're doing, you believe in that science, how do you contribute to that? How do you get involved? And I, one of the reasons why I love working with NASA and doing the Space Apps Challenge is because NASA is reaching out to the broader community of non-scientists and engaging with them in doing what NASA does best, and that's solving challenges. Um, so the Space Apps Challenge is, uh, as was alluded to before, is a uh, international um, hackathon, which is a software engineering competition, but as I also said, not, you don't have to be a software engineer to go to. It's really a, a weekend event where everybody comes together and addresses challenges posed by NASA in Earth science, space exploration, really anything that would inspire people to get involved. Um, it happens every year, founded in 2012, and Space Apps NYC was one of the uh, founding locations. We've been going strong for about 10 years now. Uh, we have 2,500 people in the New York area who are interested in space and come back every year. Uh, to 
get involved in the hackathon. Um, but I think I will let our hackers actually explain best what they like about space apps. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. I mean, NASA is attached to it. Who doesn't want to like participate or work with uh, something NASA related? I already like had been to several hackathons and I thought space apps was like the perfect combination of like the cutting edge software development and the APIs out there connecting to, you know, like the next grand frontier, which is space. So it's really exciting. I feel really happy, proud of myself that I decided to come, wake up at 6.30 to get here and hack all day. I feel really proud that I'm doing this and I'm only like 10. We've had the good fortune of getting a diverse range of skill sets on our team as well as age ranges. We have a high school student who's coding our front end and we've got some very experienced software engineers. There's so many diverse groups of people that come here with like their own mindsets. So I feel that's perfect with space because there's so much to discover. Just because you're young doesn't mean that you have less ability than others. Even though you may feel like you have less potential because you're younger, it doesn't mean that you're not capable of the same things. I have a lot of kids in my school that say, oh, I just get in the way because I don't know how to code. But the point of coming to hackathons is learning that you won't be in the way and learning that you can code. I went to space camp when I was a kid. I uh, have been into NASA and space. I saw a shuttle launch when I was a kid. Um, so it was really cool for, for me to be here and, and see the stuff that folks are working on. People can come here with virtually no programming experience or haven't seen any line of code before. And you gotta realize that it's not really about coding as it is about just a really great hub for ideas and entrepreneurship. If you have a great idea, come here and see what you can do. Go get up, hack. It's really fun. The, uh, the little girl in that video, it's uh, Alyssa Doyle. She, in 2016, was on a father-daughter team who ended up winning one of the challenges. Their project was, um, whoops, their project was a VR system uh, to, it basically was an exercise game for astronauts. When you're on the ISS, you have to exercise. When you're in low G, you have to exercise all the time to keep up uh, bone density and muscle mass. And they created a virtual reality game so that when they're on the bike or they're doing something, they can, the astronauts can pretend like they're on Earth and like solving problems and playing a game. Uh, it was really cool and they ended up winning, I think two years in a row for that, uh, one of our hardware uh, competitions. Uh, these are some photos from uh, last year's event. Uh, we're, we get a wide range of people coming to our hackathons, ages, uh, backgrounds. Like I said, it's not just uh, techies. Uh, when I, I, I started in 2015, that was my first time at a hackathon, well, at the Space Apps Hackathon, and then the following year I joined as an organizer. My team, I was the only engineer, I think, only software engineer. We had an astrophysicist, a couple designers, a project manager. Um, the whole point of the hackathon, most people think it's just, I'm gonna go and code for 48 hours. It's really who can, it's not who can write the best code, it's who can present the best at the end of it. You have four minutes to present your demo. Uh, and it's all about that presentation. Can you convey your idea to the judges and audience and show that it's not just a like pie in the sky idea, it's actually there's a proof of concept or there's something tangible that you can actually build upon. Uh, and there's a lot of really smart people. These kids actually code in Python better, way better than anyone I know. It's really daunting and I wonder what I did as a nine-year-old that these kids are coming here and showing me up. Um, last year we had 25,000 people worldwide. As I mentioned, it's an international hackathon. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, international hackathons. Um, 25 people worldwide, uh, 1,300 projects submitted. 
across all teams. Uh, there are over about 190 cities in 70 countries, 69 countries. Uh, these stats were set in 2017. They broke previous records. We're already on track to break all of these records this year. Uh, every year it's growing, getting bigger. Uh, in our local leads channel, there are several hundred uh, local organizers who are asking questions and saying, it's my first time. Hey, I enjoyed Space Apps last year. I want to host a new event. Uh, we have locations in Tokyo, uh, Nairobi, and uh, Ghana is his first year this year. Uh, we have one in Dublin, 15 in Brazil, all over the world. If you're interested in the Space Apps Challenge, there's going to be one in your area. Um, I also wanted to show you a couple projects, uh, two projects from last year. These are uh, global winners, um, or sorry, not global winners, local winners who went on to be finalists at the global level. Um, this one, Proxima, the challenge was around, it's in my notes, but I don't see it. It's around um, uh, uh, optimizing the readouts for, uh, or optimizing uh, energy outputs for solar panels. As our ability to harness the sun's energy matures, our tools must also evolve. Proxima is the next generation of intelligent power management. Using machine learning, Proxima grows with the mission by anticipating your needs. A leap over current systems, Proxima empowers your crew to make critical decisions before the storm hits. Proxima delivers knowledge when and where it's needed. A powerful dashboard illuminates key information to support confident decision making in demanding situations. In an emergency, users can respond using the decision support system to keep critical operations running. Proxima is designed for Mars but has applications here on Earth. From commercial farms to forward operating bases and remote villages, Proxima powers a bright new energy future. So the team, once they won locally, they create a video like this and submit it at the global level for global judging. Um, this is a great example of a space apps project because it's set to solve challenges in Mars where uh, local astronauts who create a habitat in Mars can then use machine learning algorithms and tools to predict changes in weather so that they can adjust power output to different uh, power sources. But with most other NASA technologies and space apps projects can be applied here on Earth to developing countries and even developed countries, understanding uh, when you should switch between different power sources so that we're not just relying on nuclear reactors or anything else. These are ways for us to actually improve life here on Earth also. Uh, similar, uh, even more so in the next one, this is Waste Not. It's uh, another winner and this one has to do with um, understanding not just carbon footprint, but understanding um, food consumption, uh, which is definitely important uh, important thing when you're going out into space. Hello, we're Team Waste Not. We are solving the what's for dinner challenge. Did you know that in New York City alone, we waste food that can fill 100 subway carts every day? That means $161 billion per year for the US. Our application tackles this problem by giving restaurant owners an easy-to-use interface that provides predictions of food consumption in the upcoming week. We integrate restaurants' order patterns with external live data, such as weather and market supply, to train our machine learning model. With our product, the restaurant industry can become more aware of their consumption and drastically decrease food waste for our society. There are plenty of cool projects like these that um, have to do with uh, problems that I'm not only experiencing here on Earth, but uh, also in New York. There are a ton of problems that we're experiencing here, whether it's transportation, food, uh, everything. And uh, it's really interesting to see how teams tie that back to their local challenges. Uh, you, also, you look at projects around the world, everywhere you see different issues. NASA challenges also address local challenges. Um, and we're more than just this. Space Apps NYC was started in 2012 with the Space Apps Challenge, uh, and we host the Space Apps Challenge every year. This year it's with the Lower East Side Girls Club, who will be up here in a minute to talk about their event. Um, but we are also looking to do more than just a Space Apps Challenge. Uh, we were founded as a grassroots organization. Uh, there's a bunch of New Yorkers who want to get involved in NASA, and we want to continue that by promoting STEM initiatives in New York City by partnering with other organizations in the area. Uh, these are just a few of the organizations. Uh, Internet Society, Jolie here in the back, who's been live streaming our events every year. Um, yeah, give him a round there. <laughs> Um, Empire Space Apps, New York Space Alliance, National Space Society, Women's Fear, of course, 
Um, and then tech organizations like SAP NextGen, Silicon Harlem, um, a bunch of these organizations we're working with to put on more events throughout the year, whether it's uh, FIRST Robotics or it's meetups to connect the tech community with the space community, uh, get organizations and startups involved in space. There's a big, wide range of uh, space entrepreneurship that is available for people who may not have previously thought of getting involved in space. Uh, and so we're, we're looking to bridge the gap of our 48-hour hacker teams put them into accelerators to build out these projects and then could potentially get some grants or some VC funding and then actually develop them into businesses. Um, and this is one of the big incentives for people to come into NASA. As you come to NASA, you work with astronauts and scientists, work on uh, solving problems in space exploration, and you could actually make a difference. Uh, when I was in, uh, the hacker in 2015, before I was an organizer, I built a, my team built a visualization of the solar system in browser technology. So anyone with a web browser can view the solar system and zoom around in it, and they could plot any kind of planets they want, create your own solar system. Some engineer from JPL was in the audience and he came up and he handed me my, my, his business card and he's like, we would love to use this in some of our internal tools at JPL and maybe uh, open source this to visualize for the community. And I, thought, I was like, holy shit, this is JPL. Like, I'm just a software engineer working at some ad company in New York. Like, this is awesome, you know? Uh, that happens every year. We get astronauts at our events. We get uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies. We get people from all over the country who are involved in the space community at our events connecting with our hackers. And it's a really easy way where if you're involved in, if you're interested in NASA, this is an easy way to get involved in the community. Um, so some other events we're working on, obviously the Space Apps Challenge. Uh, our Data Boot Camp is a series of workshops that we host every year leading up to the hackathon in the effort to prepare technologists and non-technologists alike to hit the ground running with our, in our hackathon because you only got 48 hours-ish. Uh, so you want to prepare as much as you can. So working with cloud technologies like Google and IBM and uh, Microsoft uh, with artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, that's actually happening on Tuesday if you're interested. Um, intro to space apps and open NASA APIs, that's another one. It's just a really simple, if you're new to a hackathon, here's where you can come and learn more about it. Uh, I'll let Dave and Lynn talk about Open Space. It's a really cool project uh, that we'll be hosting at the Lower East Side Girls Club in a couple weeks. Um, with Women's Fear and Hannah Payne, who's around here or in the corner, who'll be up here in a minute. Uh, we hosted a, a season finale party for this uh, previously sci-fi, now Amazon show called The Expanse. We're all huge like fans of the show. If you're interested, come talk to us about it. Um, cocktail pot party, obviously. And we also co-hosted the first Museum of Natural History hackathon uh, called Hack the Universe, where you got to hack overnight in the Hayden Planetarium. If any of you have been to the museum, I highly recommend going to the planetarium. Uh, it's so much fun. You get to stay overnight and work on the open source digital universe library that they have. Uh, and build really cool space apps like projects there. Uh, and we're working on many more this year, um, whether they're tech meetups that involve NASA technologies or their science meetups that get some uh, uh, Columbia astrophysicists or scientists from uh, NASA Goddard into the spotlight for our space apps community. We're looking to get everybody engaged with NASA. Um, so if you're interested, uh, this is last year's organizing team, uh, feel free to come chat with me afterwards. Uh, we're looking for more volunteers uh, to obviously help host these events. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved as a sponsor, we're always you know, looking for the sponsorship money. Because uh, we are a nonprofit, we are all volunteers, we make nothing off of this. We uh, do our best to build relationships with other organizations to promote themselves uh, at our events. Uh, we also, uh, if you have a venue space, I mean, this would be a great one, but you know, we can't swing this. If you have a really nice space, like the Lower East Side Girls Club, amazing space with their own planetarium. Did I mention that yet? Own the planetarium. Uh, if you have a venue, we host, we are organizing meetups as small as 30 to 50 people and hackathons as large as like 100 to 200 people. Uh, so we're, any way you want to get involved, we're there. Um, so thank you for your time. This is some contact info. I'll be hanging around. If you want to chat with me about space or NASA or really anything, I'll be here. So thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. So we are super excited to kick off the NASA Space Apps New York Challenge this year. Um, and what I wanted to do is to actually ask Maui uh, Arroyo to come and, and, and speak next. Um, 
because one of the things that I want to emphasize around the space apps challenge is that they are focused on problems in the planet. How do we use our creative talents and literally everything that we have in our brains from the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain and apply them to create solutions that make the world a better place. And there are many different angles by which we can actually arrive at creating these solutions. So as a case study of that, Maui Arroyo is a fellow young global leader who is an investor in innovation coming all the way from the Philippines to be with us tonight and who is going to share some of the investment in innovation that is happening in the Philippines. And one of the reasons why I also wanted to bring this up is because this year, Women's Fear is proud to be a sponsor, partner, co-organizer of NASA Space Apps New York, but we are also sponsoring and producing NASA Space Apps in the Philippines. Um, and the U.S. Embassy is producing the other, so there's like two NASA space apps happening in the Philippines, which is very exciting. And um, it's an important investment in democratizing innovation and the use of data to make the world a better place. So let's welcome Maui, and I'm just going to get her laptop set up. Um, yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maui Arroyo. I'm the principal of Ignite Impact. So we're an impact investment fund. We are primarily and only focused on creating an impact in the Philippines. And theoretically, a laptop should be coming up. Akio laptop. It's not working. So clearly, magic doesn't work. So. How many people in the audience have heard of what impact investing actually is? Okay, so that's like five people, seven people, excellent. So the typical thing when you hear about impact, it's not about deep impact, which I might remember that movie. Um, it's not about an asteroid hitting us. I know because we're thinking of NASA. It's about making a difference in the average person's lives, particularly with the sustainable development goals. Um, which you might know is that multicolored thing that the UN just launched a couple of years ago. That would be it. Excellent. So to meet the sustainable development goals, the UN has estimated that you we're going to have to spend as a species $5 trillion a year. 70% of that is going to have to be deployed in the Asia Pacific region. Okay. If you look particularly at ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, you're going to see a huge amount of GDP growth. It's the fastest growing region in the world. In 2030, there'll be 50 million working age people who will join um, the job market. And in 2050, there'll be 60 million people who will retire. So it's a really, really fast changing um, environment, but at the same time, the growth, the economic growth is so not inclusive. You can see that there's still a lot of poverty. So a lot of people are living under $2 a day, which is the basis for goal number one, which is no abject poverty. And aside from that, right, we do have a lot of brain drain. Right? That's because like, if you lived, it's the same thing that people in the US are experiencing. If you lived in Kearney, Nebraska, everybody's either migrating to the coast, to San Francisco, or they're going here to New York. Um, not a lot of people stay in Paducah, Kentucky, or Kearney, Nebraska. Not that they're terrible places to live, there's just not enough opportunity. I'm from the Philippines. 6,000 people leave a day. So some of those people, go to NASA, and they work at NASA. And they work for a long time, they make a lot of contribution, they're great scientists, and they want to retire. And they want to do something good for where they came from. And so, Joey Comiso, who's a friend of mine from the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, wants to retire to the Philippines, and he wants to use some of that great data that we saw, all those great visualizations, just for things like, when is in the next natural disaster going to hit us? On the average, like 24 typhoons hit the Philippines um, because you can see we're like protecting everybody from the rest of the um, Pacific Ocean. So 24 typhoons hit the country a year. 
But also, there's a lot of data that's great for commercial applications, like where are the fish? This is the 21st century. Surely we shouldn't be going around, you know, like Homer Simpson in a boat, like, doo dee doo. No, I mean, surely we should, we, we should, we are able to visualize where the fish is because you can visualize where the algae is, where the plankton is, because they fluoresce, okay? Um, and he'd like to do that for the Philippines. But there's no downloading station for this high resolution data. If you think it was bad when Joe's presentation was kind of buffering, um, trust me, you're gonna be buffering a long time in my country. Um, particularly because I think the only other country that has slower internet than we do is Afghanistan. So thank you, Afghanistan, we're not dead last. So it's a problem because, as my engineer best friend says, people ruin everything, right? There's a lot of great technology. There's so much data. In fact, we are drenched in data. There's a tsunami of data. What we don't really have is a lot of knowledge how to use that data, how to deploy that data in a practical way. Oh, and a lot of the Asia Pacific region, with the exception of Australia and New Zealand, it's a lot like the turn of the century. You know, the same people who have money, the Rockefellers, the Astors, um, the Guggenheims, the Carnegies, all these lovely avenues that you have here in New York. Um, but at the turn of the century, you're gonna have a lot of, you had a lot of undervalued assets because it was a very inefficient market. When you have a bunch of people who own most of the wealth, there's a lot of opportunity that people don't see. And this tends to be scaled by an Edison, right, who didn't have the right last name, okay? Tesla, who didn't have the right last name and didn't come from the right country. Or a Ford, who worked, who was a no-name engineer who worked for the Edison Light Company, right? So it's not about having the right stuff because you cannot fix a low trust ecosystem, which is prevalent in many parts of the world. We don't even trust each other. There are no student loans in the Philippines, no non-collateral student loans, because we don't trust each other to pay, right? I think the one guy we trust in my country is the guy who labels the expiry date on milk and bread. That's the one guy we trust. Taxi drivers, no. Politicians, definitely not. Institutions, eh, maybe, right? And then everything is fake news, right? You can always look at anything that you disagree with and say that's fake news. We have no respect for data anymore, right? So if you have a low trust ecosystem, if you have poor policy or lack of infrastructure, you're not gonna make farmers make more money if there's no farm to market road. And those are the things you cannot fix just with an app, right? So what we try to invest in is, are called inclusive innovations, okay? Inclusive innovations are not sexy. I don't have really great, you know, visuals for you because some of the inclusive innovations, look, if you don't have really, if you don't have, have access to clean water, Maybe you need a tiny Brita filter around your neck. That's not sexy. It's a Brita filter around your neck, right? And the video of that would be incredibly boring. Like turtles stampeding through molasses would be more interesting than water filtering through that Brita filter around someone's neck. Um, and they may be born in the wrong place. You know the fun thing about developing markets and emerging markets? What's a problem in my country is probably a problem in Ghana. It's probably a problem in Indonesia. And if we're talking about a digital divide, there are digital divides in this country. It's just that most Americans don't really talk about it. In Silicon Valley, if you go down the El Camino, on one side, seven-year-olds are coding. On the other side, not so much, right? And in the boroughs of New York, it's the same thing. It depends which school district. It depends which neighborhood, right? And so, in a way, the left behind, and I don't mean, I don't mean that TV show where people like get ascend and like, like the rapture, like Thanksgiving for humans, you know, that some people get ascend and some people don't. No, I mean left behind in society. 
people who aren't included or certainly don't feel included. That's the problem, right? That's a huge problem in the world today. And when you have an inclusive innovation, it's an innovation that makes a difference in someone else's daily life, right? And eventually, you're gonna take that for granted. People take these inventions and innovations for granted. Case in point, the disposable diaper. Everyone in this room, whether you have children or not, you can all be thankful for the disposable diaper. Believe it or not, for some of the young'uns in this room, there was a time we had diapers from cloth. Okay, this was not a good thing, right? Because aside from, yes, the ecological footprint, it's also incredibly disgusting, right? But do you know that it took longer to mass produce disposable diapers and make it affordable for the average person? than it did for Edison to mass produce the light bulb. And you guys are thinking, dude, that's plastic and some like cotton and some tape. Actually not, you couldn't just fix it with duct tape. You had to make it so that everybody could afford it and everybody could buy it. And thank God that we can all exercise our sense of smell due to the disposable diapers. People take these things for granted right? In many areas of the world, from Africa, from South America to here, uh, well, not here, to Southeast Asia, where I'm from, sometimes it's about modernizing agriculture or mariculture in the way we should have done it in the first place, right? Things that don't actually rape the environment, because maybe that's a bad thing. So how do we do that? How do we do that in general? We like to, first of all, when you have a tsunami of data and you see the enormity of the problem, one of the things you have to remember is don't try to boil the ocean. It is not a good idea. Because most people, and I think this is why the format of a hackathon is so useful, most people when they see the enormity of the problem like poverty, poverty, oh God, right? But there's so many different kinds of poverty. Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky says that, right? There's, every family is happy in the same way, but every family is miserable completely differently, right? So the same thing, poverty is very different. Maybe around 80% of it is yeah, access to water, access to healthcare, but a lot of it is cultural. In some parts of Eastern Europe, not having access to culture is a huge, is a huge deal. I can't afford to, ha to, to, to go to orchestral music once a year, is a huge deal, right? I can't you know, buy a Twinkie every time I want, is a huge deal. I think every, everybody has a different definition of poverty. So just don't try to boil the ocean, take one bucket, figure out how to solve that problem. The second thing is to measure to scale and to narrate to compel. Okay, so what do I mean by measure to scale? Everybody asks, what's your metric? What's your metric? How do you measure that? Well, our fund looks at increase in average household income. We think GDP, while it's a useful measure for countries, is a little bit like, mm, Diagnosing someone's heart disease by checking the engine of their car, not really the best way. I think increasing someone's household income is probably a better way to figure out if they are poor or not, or if they're you know, more wealthy over time. But there are many things that are important to us as human beings that don't have metrics, right? And this is the classic example of um, Simon Sinek. It's a really popular overshared video. How do you know? How did your wife know that she loves you? Right? Show me the number that your wife knows that she loves you. Right? At some part of that is like, well, I think most of the guys would be like, God, if I knew that number, I'd flash that on the screen all the time. But there is no number for something like that. Sometimes it's not about intensity. It's about consistency. And so sometimes you have, when you want to have a refugee or someone in abject poverty, have a sense of agency, have a sense of empowerment to say, you know what, the future is not something that's just going to happen to me. 
The future is something I can create and I can decide. There's no metric for that. So sometimes you have to have stories. So measure to scale, narrate to compel. The third one is to find teams with inherent impact. So this means that we invest in teams. We don't invest in people, because I've noticed from like grad school that you can put a bunch of really brilliant people together and they can't work <laughs> and they can't produce anything. So we like teams, teams that actually work and whose business model is inherently, it's not even an English word, impactful, right? That way, while we're investing it, we can just make sure that it's financially sustainable. You don't go from grant to grant to grant, and you're still making an impact. And you will, even if you IPO, or if you get bought by a bigger firm, right? Um, and the fourth thing is, of course, to forge them in fire. We think entrepreneurship shouldn't be fatal. It should just be really painful, right? None of this is cushy. If you want to, make a difference, I think you have to be prepared to suffer. And so we make them suffer to make the business better. So just as a key point, ooh, sorry, as a key point, because Annalisa wanted, to give me, wanted me to give some examples of investments we're making in the Philippines. So in the Philippines, about nine out of 10 people have access to water and electricity, but not consistently. Only four out of 10 people have access to the internet and access to a doctor. Six out of 10 people die without ever seeing a doctor. Um, four out of 10 adults have a valid ID, which is why three out of 10 adults um, have a bank account. That means 70% of 100 million people are ninjas. No income, no job, no assets. It's really hard to bring ninjas into the light, right? So what we decided to do with all this space and technology is to finally launch some satellite internet because a lot of the existing monopoly, they wanna crawl fiber optics through 7,600 islands. That's not gonna be really good. So they're over leveraged in that, they're over invested in it. So we're deciding to go with providing satellite internet to everybody. And turns out every 10% of broadband penetration means a 1.1% increase in GDP. And every time you increase the household income of, <clears throat> every 1% increase in household income equals 3% reduction in the number of people under the poverty line. So technically, just by investing in the national broadband provider, we are projecting an 8.8% GDP in and a 3% decrease in the um, proportion of people below the poverty line. Which means that because you have internet, you can then have an app, right, that can cut out the 22 middlemen between the farmer and me, or the fisherman and me. It makes my vegetables and healthy food much more accessible. It also opens up, <clears throat> excuse me, it also opens up e-commerce. It opens up markets for art. It, it opens up streaming for stories that are not just American. It also makes my Netflix faster, right? And that's a great thing. By giving people access to data, it empowers them as well. Plus, it creates a bunch of startup opportunities for people to invest. So impact investing isn't, about make, isn't just about making more money. It's about making money more. It's about making money more meaningful. Impact investing is an unparalleled opportunity to invest our money as we actually believe. And in, ultimately, that's kind of what business should be about. It shouldn't be about giving back, because that presumes that businesses are taking away. And maybe we should do business differently, because this is the 21st century. Thank you very much. So proud of the great work being done by investors like Maui. And you know, as we build out the Space Apps ecosystem, it's incredibly important for us to have investors become part of that community because imagine all of these apps that are being created, 
How do we scale them? How do we take them to market? How do we make sure that they're actually applicable and relevant to the environments where the apps are being created? And what Maui shared here with us is a very specific context in which there is such an opportunity for the apps we create through space apps to actually make a real difference. Um, we can't really do these you know, amazing initiatives and programs without great partners. And this year, we are super excited to welcome the Lower East Side Girls Club as a key partner and as main, a main venue sponsor for space apps. So I, I have known about Lynn Pentecost and David for a long time before I even met them through Space Apps and have admired them from afar. So it is such an honor to have you as partners. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, so nice to see a lot of girls in the audience. Um, I, you know, I don't know what to say because we thought we were just... Free to go on no, stage. we... Oh, okay. We thought we were just coming here to drink and we won't take... We won't... <laughs> We won't take much of your time because um, our table already drank our drinks, but I see a lot of people were, were uh, better than us. Um, where's Joe? Hey, Joe, where'd you go? Joe, I remember the first moon landing. <laughs> I was a hippie in Haight-Ashbury and it was very cool. <laughs> and in, in fact, um, Baskin Robbins came out with a green cheese ice cream that day and we all ran down and bought ice cream in Mill Valley. So anyway, old enough to remember that. Um, old enough to have met my husband at CBGB's. So we, we go way back. Um, I'm an anthropologist, so I, I can't say much about what you all are going to be doing at the Girls Club in two weeks. Dave's the technologist in this group. My tribe is not doing any ethnographic research on the moon yet. So, um, you know, I'll just be in the background making sure you're all fed and taken care of, that there's always hot coffee. And um, the only space that I can offer you is um, 35,000 square feet on Avenue D. So if you've never been to Avenue D, you're gonna be surprised. And Dave will tell you what's in the building. Hello. So I'd like to say I work for NASA, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so eight years ago, we launched our own moonshot. We landed on a barren, rubble-filled lot on Avenue D, and we built a base there. And among other things, uh, it should have been my idea, but it was Lynn's idea to build a planetarium. And so something like this is exactly what we built our facility for, for large events, uh, uh, science and technology related. But every, every day of the week, we're doing it for the girls in the Lower East Side, but also for the whole community. So we're happy to expand our whole uh, community. Uh, as far as uh, the planetarium and open space, we built our planetarium as a miniature of um, the Hayden Planetarium, and we built it to use a software called Uniview, which was a front end to um, the digital universe, which Carter Emmert and his team at the museum maintain. And so we've been using that for many years. Uh, his Swedish grad students who created this about 15 years ago uh, turned it into a commercial product. We spent good money on it, but Carter has come up with a new open source free uh, version of this great new platform. You can go right now and download it. We'll be having uh, boot camp uh, two days before the hackathon weekend. Uh, so if you go to openspaceproject.com, you can uh, download that and get started with it. And we're looking forward to seeing folks there. And it'll be wild. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Lynn and David, for hosting this year's Space Apps New York Global Challenge at your amazing base. Um, one of the most inspiring facts about about the Lower East Side Girls Club is that this is truly a creation born out of love. 
patience, dedication. I mean, they spent over a decade. They basically lived in the Lower East Side Girls Club and, I mean, Lower East Side and, and thought, we need to really expand opportunities for the girls in our neighborhood. We need to democratize access to all of these educational opportunities. And I was so moved by that commitment, you know, over 10 years, raising $20 million, building this amazing facility that is a dream. If you're a girl from any race, you can go there and literally be part of a very exciting program, you know, outside of school. And for us to spend overnight, where we are going to be there overnight for the NASA Space Apps, you know, New York Hackathon, um, that, that is going to be super exciting. Cool. So as Dave uh, mentioned, we're doing a uh, boot camp at the Lower East Side Girls Club this week, or next week. Um, it's really cool. Uh, open space, uh, or the Open Space Project uh, was built by the Museum of Natural History, Carter Emmert's team, in, with uh, grants from NASA. And uh, Space Apps NYC actually got involved in the beginning uh, to advise the uh, open space team on how to engage the open source community uh, in building projects like these. Open sourcing software is not as easy as just making it public. You also want to engage people on contributing back to it. So we're really happy we could work with the Lower East Side Girls Club and Carter's team into bringing this to uh, over a hundred some people that have already registered uh, for the, the boot camp, let alone the hackathon. Hopefully we can leverage this technology in the hackathon, create some really cool visualizations for the, uh, the project. So, Annalisa? Thank you. And this is open, by the way. So you may not have a background in coding. You may be simply interested in what this is all about. You are absolutely welcome. And the Lower East Side Girls Club is such a beautiful space. It's honestly one of the most inspiring spaces I've found in New York. So I just want to share a little bit about what we're doing, because we're kicking off several things tonight. And this will be we promise, followed by great cocktails. You will have the experience of being a cocktail inventor or cocktail connoisseur by the end of this evening. Um, so I am the CEO and founder and chief innovation officer of Women's Fear. And I founded Women's Fear, just very quick background. I came to this country when I was 17 years old. I was a full scholar at Mount Holyoke College. I worked at Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, high technology investment banking. Um, went to Harvard Business School, worked at Microsoft, and basically decided that I wanted to spend the time I have on this planet creating something that makes this planet better than before I arrived. And um, this women's sphere, what I ended up creating, is really a platform to do two things. To empower women and girls to create the future and to foster this community of collaboration and partnership with guys and with everyone so that we can all have a better planet and a better future. We started off with summits and festivals because I had been organizing conferences since I was 13 years old in the Philippines. But we have now expanded into these things that we are actually introducing during the Women's Fear Festival. This is our 10th year anniversary this year, and the Women's Fear Festival takes place all over New York and honestly around the world digitally the month of October. We are introducing the Women's Fear Innovation Leadership Lab, which is empowering women through technology and through STEAM to actually make a difference in the world. And the Women's Fear Incubator Network, which is training women and girls as well as guys around very key and important topics. This is to augment and to add to what we've been doing around our summits and festivals and our foundation. And so it's super important for us that you know, we build a community of partners that share our vision and that also are passionate about innovation, about creation. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, there, are, there are these bonds that bring us together, that transcend gender, that transcend race. And these are bonds over a spirit that we all share, a spirit that is curious, that wants to see a better world, that wants to see all of us coming together in harmony and unity without conflict, a better world, a better future for ourselves, for our families, for society. There are so many bonds that if we can foster their strength would hold us together as a society 
and that would become stronger than all of the other crises and conflicts that tear us apart, which as you know, if you're here in the US, we've had a lot of that lately. Um, we are introducing to the Women's Fair Innovation Leadership Lab, this is honestly inspired by the NASA Space Apps Hackathon. When this was founded by Deborah Diaz and her team, she was CTO of NASA at the time and on our advisory board, the idea was super exciting. It was about democratizing innovation, empowering citizens to use data and technology to make a the world a better place. And it was just honestly the first movement of its kind that I've seen that's really worked and scaled in the speed that it has. And this has inspired Women's Fear to think about something similar, to basically think about how we can empower women and girls around the world to express their vision around a better world and around the sustainable development goals using coding, using the arts, using video. So the first set of initiatives we have this year, which we are introducing, are the Women's Fair Global Art Fest, Women's Fair Global Code Fest, and the Women's Fair Global Video Fest. And these are all initiatives we're sponsoring and promoting around the world with over a thousand academic institutions. As long as you're connected to the internet, you can participate. Um, Alongside that, we're developing this global mentoring initiative that allows people like me, NASA data not, executive, entrepreneur, and people like you that have expertise across different areas to share your expertise and inspiration with a universe of women, girls, people that actually want to hear what you have to say and be enriched by what you want to have to say. And in par a large part of our motivation is being in service to the global goals for sustainable development, which, you know, three years ago, 193 countries around the world agreed these are the 17 goals we need to accomplish by 2030. And so for my part, I'd love to figure out how Women's Fear can contribute to that, and I'd love to figure out how we can catalyze contributions to this so that you know, within a few years, we have a million people participating in creating solutions that help us achieve this. Because at the end of the day, it is about how we create the future together. And there is no such thing as you, me. At the end of the day, we are. You know, Gavin talked about the interconnectedness of everything. Interconnectedness of the planet, the ecosystems, you and I, all of us, we are all connected. These initiatives that we have, it is about bringing us together so that through our connections, we can create something greater than what we ourselves individually would come up on our own. The sum being greater than the parts. And so we invite you to create with us. And in the spirit of creating with us, we are actually going to shift topics. We are going to be creating cocktails. Um, it has been an honor, so just, just so you know how serendipity works, I am about to introduce to you one of the smartest women I've ever met, Hannah Madeline Gates Payne. She was COO of Hack New York, and I've known her as a co-organizer with Joe of the Expanse Party, Expanse Finale Viewing Party. Um, and, and, and I don't know if any of who here has watched The Expanse? Please raise your hands. Yes. Best sci-fi show ever after Star Trek. <laughs> so if you're a sci-fi aficionado, you understand what The Expanse is about. You know, think about a few hundred years from now, okay? The, the, the Mars has been colonized. NASA actually succeeded in colonizing Mars. Mars has been colonized and what are the conflicts and drama that actually, you know, expand from the Earth into the whole solar system? Hannah has joined, since that party, Hannah has joined our team to actually lead the Women's Fair Global Code Fest, Art Fest, and Video Fest, which is partly, you know, under the umbrella, the Women's Fair Global Steam Fest, under our Innovation Leadership Lab. But in addition to that, or rather even before that, she has invented 56 cocktails inspired by the sci-fi show. 
So what we will be doing tonight as we close this evening, speaking about connection, creativity, you know, being a part of this amazing community, we will be investing um, in our time in inventing cocktails, or rather, in, you know, following Hannah's invention, but also sampling some of that invention. So those of you that are in the front row, you have elements of what it takes to make Hannah's cocktails that she's invented, and she's gonna speak a little bit more about this. Those of you that are in the second row, you will be tasting what she's invented. Those of you that are in the back row need to move over to where there is alcohol <laughs> so that you can partake. And, um, and a lot of this is honestly because we do believe that it is so important we do come together. We come together over food, over drinks, over creativity, over steam. This is a very steam approach to innovation. So without further ado, let's bring over Hannah Madeline Gates Payne. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, I feel like the weirdest talent show event coming up here right now. <laughs> So, um, as Annalisa said, we are here in part tonight to launch the Women's Sphere Innovation Festival and the start of the uh, mentoring program for the STEAM Fest. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about before coming on today was the fact that um, women in innovation are a great thing in the bartending world right now. Right now, especially in New York, we have a lot of women at the forefront of bars, behind the bar, or as business owners and getting to know them has been a real treat for me over the past year. Um, I'm working with cocktails uh, from the, the A in Steam side right now as a form of fan art um, about this show, The Expanse, which keeps coming up tonight. I don't really, it's just really good. Um, I'm a monster nerd. Um, I, was, I was interning at the NASA Center that's near um, Goddard, so meeting you has been really kind of terrifying and amazing. Um, and um, yeah, I will talk a little bit about cocktails in general, and then we will go through the process that me and my partner use to make cocktails based on characters and ideas, and then you will make some along with me, and then we will drink. <laughs> and that is the plan. So um, we are all probably pretty familiar with what a cocktail is at this point in our lives. Um, a cocktail is an alcoholic drink with more than one ingredient. Um, by this definition, um, a gin and tonic does not count because it is a, a long drink over ice, but I, I count it. Um, we have our base spirits. We have whiskey and gin and vodka and that kind of thing. Um, increasingly, um, international spirits like Aquavit or Cachaca are getting to be more known all around the world, and people are innovating using things that they've never tried before, which is really exciting right now. Um, you can add flavored liqueurs like um, we're going to be working with a pomegranate liqueur in just a few minutes. There's fruit liqueurs, nut liqueurs, all sorts of interesting things that you can be adding. Um, amari, which are primarily Italian aperitifs that have a really bitter herbal component to them. They can be served on their own, but they're also becoming more and more part of cocktails. Uh, wine products go into them. Um, vermouth you're completely familiar with as martini or Manhattan drinkers. Yay, Manhattan. Um, and then, of course, non-alcoholic mixers, which we'll be working with a little bit as well. Um, ice is an important thing to talk about when we talk about cocktails. Um, ice does two things. It will chill your drink and it will also dilute it. That second part is something people often forget about, but is also a really important part of how you want your drink to be. Um, most cocktails do get chilled, for, with the exception of the odd hot one. Um, and you can use either a gigantic ice cube, which is becoming really popular in fancy craft bars where they cut their own ice with a giant saw, you can have drinks over crushed ice, you can have drinks on the rocks like you might normally imagine, and you can also serve drinks like in a martini glass without any ice at all after they've been chilled. Um, here are some of the equipment that we use as bartenders. We've got two kinds of shakers. You've got three-part shakers in front of you today because they're pretty much the easiest things for people to use at home. This is a Boston shaker. The two pieces click together and form a seal, and sometimes they stop forming a seal, and it's not good. <laughs> Um, jiggers of different kinds. You've got two sizes in front of you, so you can get 
any sort of measurement that you would like. It's like SAT problems. Um, some drinks are stirred. Um, we have muddling for mojitos and that kind of thing. Um, I squeeze a lot of fruit juice. We've got a fruit juice squeezer over here. These are the kinds of things that you see behind the bar and more and more people have in their own homes. So it's kind of exciting. I am part of a partnership of total nerds. Um, this is my friend Kagan McTain. He lives in San Francisco. And every week for three hours, we get on the phone and we create another drink. Um, and we, we do it with uh, like drinks that are like a tablespoon big because it takes a lot of iterations. And the first time we tried it with you know, shot-sized drinks, we were under the table. Um, but yeah, every week we get together and we decide on the next character we are going to be doing a drink for. Um, we started this a little bit over a year ago and we do slightly over a drink a week. We do a drink every week without fail, plus some special things. Can I have the next slide? Um, so we do drinks based on characters. Here's one. Next slide. Uh, drinks on ships, occasionally. Um, drinks based on the books. Um, some drinks feature prominently in the Expanse novels. And while we want to create our own drinks to represent characters, sometimes characters have a favorite, and we put it in there as well. Next. Um, sometimes we do drinks based on the factions. Um, Annalisa was talking earlier about the premise of the Expanse, which is the fact that um, Earth has now colonized Mars. Mars is now a thriving society built on terraforming itself. And then there are also people out in space working in the asteroid belt, harvesting minerals, harvesting water for fuel, that kind of thing. Um, and they are a fairly disenfranchised group of people, the Belters. And one of the things I like best about the show is that they have their own language. The other really weird, nerdy thing that we do is, uh, wait a second, oh, whatever, go back to, if you wouldn't mind, um, is uh, I teach the language that is spoken on the Expanse by the Belter people. They have a conlang that they speak. It is really fun, um, and it's slowly growing. It only has, you know, several hundred words in it right now, but we, we know all of them and we teach it. Um, and it's, it's a really fun, exciting activity. And you are laughing really hard at me right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak some after, sure. <laughs> so we've made, so drinks based on characters, drinks based on ships, on factions. Um, we have a couple of um, drinks that are based on kids. Next slide. And of course, they have no alcohol at all. Um, we had a lot of fun coming up with that one. Next up. Um, so that's us. Recently, we hosted a pop-up bar at a con in California, and um, next slide, won a whole bunch of awards, which was super exciting. Um, <laughs> and so what I'm going to be talking about right now is how we take the idea of a person, who they are, and distill it <laughs> into a drink. Um, next slide. Okay. so. Um, the first thing we do when we start thinking about a character is we go into our massive spreadsheet and we write down a few character traits of this person. How would we put this person into a few words? Um, and there are several variables that we work with. Um, you can follow along on your handouts if you feel so inclined. Um, one of the things we think about is how much alcohol do we really want in this drink? Do we want this to be a drink that absolutely knocks you flat? Do we want this to be something you can sip over a long period of time? Um, and also, alcohol has a, has a harsh taste. It has a lot of intensity to it. So when we do high ABV cocktails, we're often thinking of somebody who's extremely driven. They're a leader. They're outspoken. They've got ambition. Um, this that's on the screen it is an example right now of um, Ensign Loftus, who is so self-righteous about Mars and making sure that her team is OK, that she tries to single-handedly take over the bridge of another ship. So she got a shot. Um, alternatively, we have low ABV drinks, um, which are either people who are milder in general or possibly easily led as people. Next slide. Um, here's a Secretary General of the UN. Unfortunately, by the time of the events of the Expanse, the Secretary General is kind of a weak guy. He, uh, he's easily led by the people around him. People manipulate him into things. So he became a lot less of a high ABV drink, something that was way smoother and not as strong. But low ABV next doesn't necessarily mean um, that this person isn't a leader. Here we have a drink for Anna Volovodov, who is one of the greatest leaders on the show, but she's tremendously mild and gentle, and she gets her way by clear thought and persuasion, and we need more people like her in the world. Next slide. Um, another element we can do is fruity things. Um, this is a drink we did for April Fools. 
for a character who has literally no lines, but we made her up the backstory. Um, so fruity things can either be fun and exciting or bright personalities, um, like we imagined for her. Uh, next slide. Um, this is another person who is a really bright, bubbly personality, even though she's more complex beneath the surface. Or they can be, yep, um, uh, fruit can also be a sweet thing that denotes uh, equanimity of spirit or having a, a gentle nature in general. Um, fruit can also be bitter and sour. This is the first drink we ever did. Uh, it's the first speaking role on the show. A guy who is, who's always up on his soapbox talking about how they need to have a revolution. Um, so we gave him sour and bitter elements and a frothy uh, garnish to deal with how he is as a person. Next. Um, here's another person with some frothy rhetoric and a lot of sharpness to her personality. Another one of those really intense Martian military people. Next. Um, bitterness, um, which often comes from Amari or from bitter fruits, is often a sign that somebody has had hardship in their life or they are bitter as a person. Next slide. Here's one of our villains. She managed to be bitter and sour all the way up to the end. Spoilers, they kill her. And, um, <laughs> and she, is, she is full of malice right up until the moment she dies. And so she got a super sour, bitter drink. Um, Another thing we can do is um, split bases on our drinks, and that can add complexity. Here's a character who is born in the belt and is a real man of the people, but he's also incredibly eloquent, and he's a social chameleon. He's able to work with all sorts of different kinds of people. And so we split the base of his drink. Um, you'll see some of the elements in it in one of the drinks in a few minutes, um, which reminds me I should start infusing some chili peppers. So while Hannah is chopping those up, for any of you who are so far interested in watching The Expanse, we've been kind of hinting at it the entire night, um, Hannah has been part of a community of fans who recently saved the show from cancellation. Sci-fi, big thanks to Hannah. Um, in fact, during our season finale party last year, um, actors from the show came to the event because Hannah knows them. Uh, apparently, and they all gave her a big hug and they thanked her and the rest of the community for literally saving the show and <laughs> providing them employment for the next few years. Um, <laughs> and they actually just started tweeting out photos of, hey, we're back on the set now, we're, we're doing this, it's awesome. Um, the show is now on Amazon, uh, you can watch the first two seasons and they're coming back sometime this year. Yeah, thanks so much for mentioning that. Um, yeah, it was, one of the best things about the show is the way the fan base is so welcoming and inclusive. I, I see a lot of sci-fi shows and I don't always feel that I can recommend their fan bases. On the other hand, with The Expanse, I am literally a moderator on the subreddit for the show. And normally I would consider that like the lowest, worst corner of the internet. But this is actually a pretty welcoming and awesome place to be. and so. Coming together as fans has been a really fun thing over the past year. Um, so this is Lieutenant Lopez, who starts off as a um, tremendously aggressive interrogator character, but later becomes an ally. Um, by mixing different bases in there, and also by adding some of those delicate fruit flavors, you can talk about him as somebody who isn't just an aggressor, someone who has an evolution. One of the things we think about is dr as how drinks start when you, they first go into your mouth, while you have them in your mouth and then as you swallow and afterward. Um, we'll be playing with that a little bit with some of the villains later on. Um, next, please. Here's another character who has a lot of sides to him. Um, he comes across as tremendously aggressive um, using his, his physical powers of persuasion more than anything else. But after he is spoken to and he understands the situation, he becomes a powerful orator. He becomes someone who manages to get a group of desperate people unified and working together to save the children among them. So working with that, using all sorts of different ingredients was interesting, trying to communicate that complexity. Next, please. Um, other weird things we can do. Um, this one changes in the same way. It comes across very sweet but at the end it has a little bit of a strange aftertaste. It's a bit sour, it's a bit bitter, and it's because he's a spy. He's got a disguise. So we had fun with that. Next, please. Um, we thought a lot about how to do cocktails for villains, because villains are inherently unlikable, but we want all of our drinks to be tremendously drinkable. 
Um, so working with that has been a lot of fun. This is one of the worst villains on the show. And um, when we put his drink together, we wanted it to be clear and cold, just as calculating as he is. He is a scientist doing very bad things. Um, and we also wanted it to just make you feel a little bit unsettled, even though it was tasty. So the combination of the mezcal, which has some smokiness, with the slight licorice flavor of the absinthe rinse, gave you sort of a weirdness you couldn't quite identify. And then squeezing lemon over the top, but not garnishing it with a lemon peel, gave it a little bit of an oily sheen, and it was like totally wrong looking in the best way. Um, next, please. Um, here's another character who, who tries to come off as this tremendous patriot of Mars and somebody who is just working to um, work for the good of Mars, but he's actually covering up a horrible government plot. So on top, we've given him Mars red clouds, but on the inside, he's not a true patriot. He's got, he's just pale and sad. <laughs> Next. Um, here's another really terrible villain, um, somebody who comes across as sweet, almost sickly sweet. So we put honey in this. He's a, he's a doctor who works with kids. Um, but he turns out to be a villain, and at the end of the drink, you get this note of bitterness that, you know, says, keep watching this guy, don't trust him. Um, uh, another thing we do is have drinks that share an ingredient that talk about relationships between characters. I was talking about high and low ABV earlier. Sometimes we have a big ship that has, uh, that packs a huge punch alcoholically, but we have a shuttle that goes along with that ship. They share a few ingredients, but one of them has a lot less alcohol. Um, these two people, this person and the next one, um, could not be more different. One is this very elegant, refined scientist who dines with high society and always has, you know, a, a story to tell in his intense Australian accent. Um, and the other guy is a man of science who has no time for the other guy's shit. He just wants to get to the point all the time. But they end up, even through this adversarial colleagueship, they end up becoming friends and they end up really understanding each other and enhancing one another's ideas. So when we made these two drinks, we included um, the allspice dram in between them because it worked really well with each drink, but in a totally different way. Next. Um, one of the most fun things we ever did um, was a character who appears in two different ways. I will not go further into how that goes down. Um, but what we did was we created a drink that was the same entirely except for one ingredient and have that ingredient switched, flip it, and um, become the other side of this person. So that was a lot of fun and doing the graphics for it took forever. <laughs> um, another way to, uh, another thing we do is talk about how ingredients are associated with concepts. For example, this drink contains Frangelica, which is hazelnut liqueur. And if you have familiarity with Celtic mythology, that deals with intelligence. And this guy is very wise. He's got a lot of good advice to pass along. So that's another way we think about things. Um, and then, Every once in a while, you know a character has a favorite thing in the world. This guy's favorite thing is coffee, and it just had to go into his drink. Next. Um, we have a little bit of fun visually. Um, this is a character who has like three lines, but she's so unforgettable. She's in the hallway. She's smoking. She, uh, the, the cop character comes to talk to her and try to get information, and then they just they have this like complete nonsense exchange. It's hilarious. And so we made her drink also smoky. Um, we also had a stealth ship, and we used activated charcoal in it to make it a completely, utterly black drink. And that was pretty fun. Yep. Um, we also have fun with garnishes. Um, we, you know, you can imagine most drinks are garnished with fruit or some kind of uh, herb or something. In this case, we used a piece of pear stabbed in the back, because this guy's a massive betrayer. Um, so now we'll move on to actually trying to make some, if you would like to do that. Uh, we are starting with y'all in the middle, so other people can see what you get up to. Um, so when we started thinking about this character, um, so has any, so I didn't actually see the hands, has anyone seen The Expanse? Okay, um, you're at this table, do you want to say, how would you describe Drummer? <laughs> I'm going to ask you. Um, she was, um very methodical and focused on what she had to get done, and she was uh, uh, almost ruthless in getting anything that she wanted to kind of go, go after. So yeah, she's somebody who is entirely for her people. 
She is intense, she is driven, she is completely ruthless, sometimes even with herself. Um, but she gets done what needs to be done. And then afterwards, she parties incredibly hard. Um, so we wanted to start, um, we wanted it to be a, a drink with a bright color and some really intense flavors. And we thought because of her partying, we might do tequila. Um, and that's where the, the base of this came in. And then we started thinking about what would go well with that. Cranberry juice is bitter and astringent, so it's something that is intense. And the lime went along with that as well. So get out your shaker, and I will get out mine. Okay, so here we have, so this is now as cold as it's going to get. I can feel that it's really cold and it's not getting any colder. You can pour that out and share it among your table. I put lime wedges for garnish. We'll move on to the next one. The second drink of three uh, is for a character who is different, also strong female character. This is Doris. Um, she is a botanist whose home is destroyed. And um, she's strong in a different way. She's less intense, but she's tremendously optimistic about things. And even when things are terrible, she finds moments of delight. And that's pretty cool. So to, th to talk about weightlessness, which is one of the things she experiences and enjoys, we thought about champagne. And that also has some delight to it. OK, so this third drink does not represent a character. It represents a faction. Um, this represents the most militant wing of the Belters, the OPA. Um, so these are for fiery revolutionaries. We included smoked peppers. We have Chipotle. You got everything in there? So um, at the Expanse finale party, we served three drinks for the three factions. And this is the one that the VFX producer of the show drank five of and enjoyed a lot and then made a speech. Yeah. All right. So in, cheers, in Lang Belta, the language of the Expanse, we say Yam Seng. Yam Seng. Yes. It's from Singapore. pictures of these, that some of which have been drunk, which is kind of scary because they were supposed to be diluted. Um, I can see why people are so happy in here. Anyway, thank you so much for drinking with me tonight. Um, I look forward to working with you in my official capacity some more. But if you're interested in the weird, nerdy drink side of things, that's our Twitter. Thanks. I believe that concludes our program for tonight. Annalisa, is that correct? We're done? You can feel free to hang out, drink, eat whatever is left over there. Uh, and if you have any questions, we'll be around. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We hope to see more of you. And um, I may have forgotten to mention the Women's Fear Festival takes place for the entire month of October. So stay tuned for all the various events we have. We have everything from summits about emerging leadership to capital. We have a healing energy and power event. We are sponsoring the NASA Space Apps Hackathon and encourage companies that are represented here to sponsor as well. And um, thank you for being with us. Sorry. Hackathon registration is still open. Go to spaceapps.nyc, October 19th, 20th, and 21st. Thank you. Um, Ayesha, can you uh, say, introduce yourself, your full name, your organization? My name is Ayesha Oglevy. I I'm actually a new web developer. Um, I just went to General Assembly as well as Priscola's here in New York City. Uh, I am also on Community Board 12 of Manhattan, which is in the most northern part of Manhattan, which are the uh, neighborhoods of Washington Heights and Inwood. I'm the chair of Housing and Human Services, and I'm also the chair of IT for, those district, for that district. That is so impressive. How did you feel about the experience today? 
It was a fantastic event. I am so happy and excited that I decided to attend. Uh, when I saw the email, I immediately knew that this was somewhere that I wanted to be. And coming here and taking part and hearing all of what was said and also just experiencing, you know, being with this network of people was fantastic. And what are some of your um, things to do in the future? What are you looking forward to do with us and with what you've learned here? I'm looking forward to do, doing so much. I actually uh, wasn't fully aware of everything that Women's Fear does, um, everything that Space App does, the opportunities that are created here for developers, as well as people who are novice, people who may just have ideas. I didn't realize um, the opportunity to actually connect with an amazing world-renowned institution such as NASA as well um, to bring ideas from people from all over and you know especially local here in New York City um, so it's, it's very exciciting. Thank you so much for being a part of tonight. Thank we you. Look forward to I really having appreciate great it. collaborations and partnerships with you. Thank you. Thank you Ayesha. Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Stevenson van der Oder, and I'm privileged to be the state president for this year in uh, New York State of, uh, in JCA New York State. And what I do is that uh, along with the executive committee, we run and implement projects of the New York State when it comes to Junior Chamber International. So as you may know, we are a young leaders organization from 18 to 40. Um, spanning across uh, 80, 80, 80 years already in, in our jurisdiction. And with that, we develop young leaders uh, to become their best, uh, learning networking, learning individual development trainings, uh, learning business staff, and learning as well to, have, uh, to, to foster friendships around the world and doing good for the community. So in totality, it's something that one would be able to give back to the community while continuously being able to learn for themselves. Stevenson, we are so excited to have you here with us during our kickoff event for several things. We're kicking off the Women's Fair Festival, we're kicking off the NASA Space Apps New York City Global Challenge, we are kicking off the Women's Fair Innovation Leadership Lab, how, how was the experience for you of this event? What to are some of your key takeaways? To me, it's very overwhelming. Uh, one has to realize that with whatever progress humankind gets into, technology is always at the forefront. And one realizes that one cannot live without technology. And for our stakeholders and for our members, I feel that we are all indebted to technology and science for whatever it has afforded to our humanity. And with that, we should take a look into how we too can utilize much of its advantage and much of how we can truly take care of them to our advancement. I mean, Thank you so much for being with us, yeah. Stevenson. We're really inspired by your presence and by your leadership of JCs. And you too. You've of done a great job. And you too. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jolly. Hi, my name is Maui. I'm a serial entrepreneur, an impact investor, an educator, and a biologist. And I'm from the Philippines. And I was really pleased to speak at the Women's Fear Festival today. Maui, we are super excited to have you grace the kickoff and launch of the Women's Fear Festival and the NASA Space Apps New York Global Challenge. What were some of the key messages that you shared with the audience? Because I heard them and they were super inspired by what you shared. And I was listening as well, but you know, what, what were some of the, if you were to share in maybe 30 seconds, some of the message you shared today, what would that message be you'd share with the broader world? Well, I think the first thing is to think about impact investing, which is investing to make a social impact, is not about making more money. It's about making money more, just making money more meaningful, making money more tangible, uh, making a tangible difference in someone's everyday life, which is really what I talked about. It's about inclusive innovation. So these are innovations that might not be sexy. Maybe they weren't born in Silicon Valley. They weren't born in um, Boston or any place where usually funders find them. And because they're making a difference in someone else's life, 
they might not be sexy. It might just be as simple as a water filter for someone who doesn't have access or consistent access to clean water. And these are the innovations that need to be um, funded as well. It helps that we do, um, we, make a, we make sense of the large amounts of data that we can get from NASA. Um, there's so much data that we're drenched with facts. Um, it's really a matter of finding the right businesses and the right vehicles so that we can make the best use of that data from NASA, like helping small fishermen by finding out where the fish are. Um, there's so many things we can do, and I'm so inspired by um, the hackathon that's happening here in New York and the grassroots community development with so many people in New York. Um, and the Philippines now. And the Philippines now, so we're excited for that. And I'm, I'm really thinking that when we do, when you do, sorry, the um, space apps uh, in, Makati, in, in, in the Philippines, we should definitely be there, so we, there might be a couple of ideas we can fund. That would be so amazing. So I'm really excited. Maui, it's been such a pleasure and an honor to My have pleasure. you with us. Thank today. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wally. So, this has been such an exciting launch for the NASA Space Apps New York City Challenge for the Women's Fair Festival and our innovation initiatives. Joe, do you have any reflections you want to share? Oh yeah, it was great having everybody here who cross-pollinating networks from Women's Fear and Space Apps, uh, bringing everyone together around cocktails, because everyone loves cocktails. Um, the, uh, the camaraderie that we were able to, uh, to cultivate through uh, everyone getting together and forming their own cocktails uh, was really fun. And I think everyone really enjoyed the, uh, the presentations that we had. Uh, a lot of people were not too familiar with, not necessarily NASA, but the initiatives that NASA was uh, engaging in like Space Apps Challenge, both in New York and the Philippines and elsewhere. And knowing that there's a Goddard Institute for Space Studies here in New York, most people don't realize the reach that NASA has into New York. Um, it, was re it was really encouraging seeing people, how they, they, they took to that. Uh, and after the, the chats I've had afterwards, uh, talking with people about the presentations, it was just really motivating for me knowing that there's, there's such a, um, uh, such a drive for people to to want to engage with NASA and activities like the Space Apps Challenge and the Women's Fears Festival. Yeah, and I feel I feel so excited and actually very hopeful. You know, there have been so many things happening in the world, and I feel like what we're doing is um, is a shining light. It's like getting everyone together. We're doing something exciting. We're focused on the good we can create. We're focused on using data and science to create something amazing that makes the planet better. And yes, because Women's Fear is in it, it is about gender equality. And what I love about Space Apps, to be honest, is it has always been gender equal. From the moment it was conceived, and how I'm seeing it in New York now, I'm seeing it in the Philippines, other parts of the world, it's like one of the most inclusive communities. It's like diversity and inclusion as it's in DNA. Well, that goes at, to the core of the Space Apps Challenge, is solving problems to further human exploration into space. That itself, uh, go, cuts across all gender and demographic boundaries. Uh, I've been running Space Apps NYC for a couple years and there's been very, there has not been a need to really outreach into particular demographics to provide a equally balanced and inclusive community. It's just naturally formed because everybody is interested in this and everybody's motivated by it, which to me is inspiring coming from a tech uh, industry where it's such a problem of homogenized organizations going into space apps and NASA, uh, it's, it's really encouraging to see that uh, it doesn't take much for it to bring everybody together to solve problems in space exploration. And I think what we're doing really gives me hope for the future. I really do think all of these collaborations, the partnerships, the community, the warmth in the community, the inspiration, the energy, it means that there is hope for the future and for us creating a better future together. So thank you so much for being an amazing partner. Oh, thank you, Annalisa. Thanks so much. So Hannah led a cocktail workshop today that really brought the community together around her cocktail inventions. She is one of the smartest women I know, having invented more than 56 cocktails together with her partner in this powerful duo, Payne McTain. Hannah, what are some of your thoughts about the day and how all of our events unfolded today? 
Um, today has been absolutely wonderful, Annalisa, and thank you so much for having me as a speaker. Um, today has been so much fun. I think this was actually my first official Women's Sphere event. Welcome to the team. Thank you so much. Um, it was wonderful to meet everyone here. It was such a diverse group of thinkers, and I loved how everyone had a different perspective on working on improving the planet for humanity and this planet as a whole. Um, I love listening to the speakers. I love being in front of the group and meeting everyone, and it showed that everyone was both really, really brilliant you guys and really do karaoke fun. Now? Whoa, is that what you're so Gavin, oh, yeah. Gavin just joined us. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so we have with us the famous Gavin Schmidt who is the head of the NASA Goddard Institute. <laughs> Gavin, what are some of your thoughts from the evening? Um, I think uh, drinking and sciencing uh, go together like, uh, like, like, like things that should go together. Thank you so much for inspiring <laughs> us with your message today. It's been so amazing having you with us. Do you have any um, message for the rest of the world? You know, we need to understand what's going on. We need to see what's going on. We need to understand why things are changing. And we need to use that information to make better decisions. And NASA is involved in that, not just because we're, we're looking at things on Mars or in the deep universe, but because we're looking at things on Earth as well. And, you know, the things on Earth, we are the only planet that we know of that's habitable. And that means that we need to take care of this perhaps in uh, a little bit better way than we have been doing so. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that we learn from the universe. And so far, what we've learned from the universe is that Earth is a unique place. And that specialness, you know, that, that uniqueness of, of Earth, uh, we have to both understand why that's unique, but also make sure that it stays the same way that it is. Gavin, thank you so much. You are our new best friend. We absolutely love your message and your message of stewardship of the planet, yeah. our only planet. Thank you so much. So far. Thank Welcome you very much. and to the family. Thank you.